Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'll start the vocational uh, uh, session now, and I can't tell you how pleased I am uh, to share this talk with you today. I hope what we do here in the next few minutes will ultimately create some space on how to think about imitating Christ uh, and how that is a means to flourishing. At the end of my presentation, I'll open the floor for questions, and I'll be super happy uh, to think out loud with you at that point. Uh, you're going to discover very soon that I'm not really an expert on the topic I'm going to share with you. I am one who has been discovering my need to be on this journey. And so I look forward to hearing from you about how we can best live this journey out together. Um, I, I titled it Becoming Common, um, Experiencing the Humility that Brings Us to an Unexpected Peace. Um, I hope what we talk about here today will help you think about that. Several years ago, I worked as a minister to the Honolulu Church of Christ. That's right, the Honolulu in Hawaii. When I first arrived in Honolulu, I thought it was paradise, and it is for some of us. The weather is perfect year around. It's never too hot. It's never too cold. As Newman, the mailman, said, the air is so dewy sweet, you don't even have to lick the stamps. I quickly grew accustomed to making the most of my time in paradise. Every week, I tried to log lots of miles on my bicycle, spend several hours at the beach, and to be outdoors whenever I possibly could. But as I said, it's paradise for some of us. For others, it's a trap. Before 9-11, cities on the mainland would infamously send homeless people to Honolulu with a one-way one plane ticket. After all, it's always warm, it's always pleasant, and a person could be homeless in a healthier way in Hawaii than they could in Detroit or Chicago, especially in the winter. But as a result of some of these policies, Honolulu had at one time the highest rates of homelessness per capita in the country. I began to organize our church, as well as some of the other churches in the city, to minister to the homeless. We began investing in one of the shelters in the city, started campaigns to provide health care and tents, and we got extremely active in providing meals to our neighbors. And I grew increasingly passionate about this work. I viewed it as a primary function of my mission. Well, one afternoon, I rode an 80-mile loop on the island to train for an upcoming bike race. I would often ride through Kapiolani Park, which is right between Diamond Head and Waikiki Beach. On this particular ride, I ran out of, I ran out of water a bit earlier than I had planned for, so... By the time I reached the park again, I was wrung out. I sat on the tabletop of a picnic table and refilled my water bottle several times to rehydrate. As I gazed out on the waves coming in, a homeless man sat on the table next to me, and he silently watched the water as well. He reached into his duffel, and he pulled out a medium-sized bag of Cheetos, the hard, crunchy kind and began munching on them. We sat in silence for several minutes, staring at the water, and then he decided to break the silence. Without taking his eyes from the ocean, he reached his arm out with a bag in my direction and said, Geo. I was surprised. And in my surprise, I said, no thanks. I hadn't expected to talk to the stranger. We'd not said a word to each other so far in the entire encounter. Frankly, I still had cotton mouth because I'd been so dehydrated, and the last thing I wanted to munch on was a dry, salty, cheesy snack. Truth be told, he smelled terrible. And I couldn't imagine that he spent as much time hand washing and as much money on Purell as I do. But also, he's homeless. He needs that food. 
He needs it a lot more than I do. I'm a person of privilege, and I don't need to be taking food from those who probably don't get enough. After, a few, after just a few minutes more, I refilled my water bottle a fourth time, and I said, see you, brother. He didn't respond. As I finished the ride from the park back to my house, I kept thinking about this odd and unexpected encounter. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted the moment back. I realized that I'd missed an opportunity to really act like a brother. I'll return to this story in just a few minutes. We like to think that in America, we live in a culture that is free from the social hierarchy that exists in other cultures. We don't, but we like to think that we do. We don't have to bow to a king or a queen. We don't have a caste system where people are necessarily born into a higher station than others. In fact, a lot of people believe that they are judged only by our, by our merit. Our worth as humans is found in what we accomplish, not in who our ancestors are. That's probably open for discussion, but I want to spend some time focusing on this idea of merit. As I talk to you, I have three diplomas on my wall right up in front of me. My bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and my PhD diploma. That one is in the center, and it has the best place on my wall. On each of these degrees is written that such and such degree is conferred on me with, and I'll quote from my ACU diploma, all the attendant honors, rights, and privileges. And when I look at these diplomas, I'm reminded of the work I did to earn them. And it was work too. Lots of sleepless nights, lots of term papers and hard knocks and barriers and challenges. My degrees did not come easily to me. I had to work to earn those degrees. That's why the diplomas are on my wall. And so there is a part of me that likes to be recognized for it. I earned the title doctor in front of my name. And when I earned that title, my mom had it printed on a really nice fountain pen that sits right here on my desk. When I'm introduced to students, I'm often introduced as Dr. Self. I get paid more because of the degrees that I've earned than I would have otherwise. And as a person who works in higher education, there are all kinds of other titles and honors that I can measure myself against, my rank, my position title. I can even measure myself according to the number of medals in my regalia. Some of the colors in my academic regalia can only be worn by folks with a PhD. And so it doesn't take long, and the path is very easy to discover that we hold on to titles and merits until our knuckles turn white. We start to equate winning with merit. We earned whatever honors, rights, and privileges we have. And when we start to lose them, we start to devalue our own worth or imagine that others devalue our worth. Imagine the prize, the pride, that comes with earning lots of money and the despair that comes with losing it. Imagine the joy that comes from working your way up from the mail room to the board room and the humiliation that comes from finding yourself back in the mail room. Remember the way that your team felt when you won the game, like you earned it because you gave 110%. And the way you felt when you lost the game, like you were worthless. In fact, there is a cognitive bias that oftentimes plays on people who like to gamble. The outcome bias is one that assumes that winnings are based upon skill and mental ability, and that losing is evidence of mental failure. And so, 
there is this cultural worldview in the West, and especially in our own country, that we have earned whatever good happens, and that bad things are a result of failure. If I'm a CEO of a company, it's probably because I worked really hard to get there. If I clean up behind elephants in the circus, it's probably because I didn't try hard in school to get a better job. If I have a nice home, I earned it. If I live in a tent, well, I earned that too by not trying hard enough or not being smart or resourceful enough. Other faith traditions, including the philosophy of the Stoics, center upon finding a place of peace that is free from these excesses. Seneca wrote, no person has the power to have everything they want, but it is in their power not to want what they don't have and to cheerfully put to good use what they do have. The virtue in this context is to be glad about whatever diplomas are on my wall, to be content with those that are not attainable for me. And virtue leads to flourishing because we choose to do, we choose to use what we have for the sake of others. And so what oftentimes happens in these scenarios is that we try to talk ourselves into doing good and avoiding harm with those honors, rights, and privileges. Use them for the common good and try not to get puffed up. Use them for good and not to be haughty or arrogant. If you're wealthy, use your wealth to make the world a better place. If you have titles, use those titles to create opportunities for others. If you have power, use that power well. That's how I used to think. Up until I encountered the man in the park. It was on my ride home that I realized I had a view of myself that was not as his brother. I treated him like someone who needs me, but I treated myself as someone who does not need him. I was still allowed to think of myself as better than him. I took care of the homeless. I am a person of privilege, and I've been focusing on using that privilege for good. I wanted to take care of people who didn't have a place to lay their heads. I thought that I was doing the right thing by embracing all that I have, including free time and access to resources, and then sharing some of that with the someone who's less fortunate. And God knows that I've made good choices and even had some lucky breaks as well, so that I don't need handouts from homeless people. A brother, on the other hand, is an equal. A brother can be depended upon, but he also depends upon his family. A brother is more than a benefactor or a benevolent caretaker. A brother also lives in need. By the time I had returned to my house, I wanted so badly to turn back the clock and really respond as a brother and say, yeah, I'll take a Cheeto. In John chapter 4, when Jesus is sitting by a well in the middle of the day, a Samaritan woman approaches to draw water from the well. He asks for something that both stuns and mystifies her. Give me a drink. The Samaritan woman assumes that someone with all of the attendant honors, rights, and privileges of being a Jewish man who would never speak to a Samaritan woman, let alone the fact that this guy didn't bring his own cup. So the only way he's getting a drink is if he uses her cup and drinks after her. And in her defense, their shared culture was one that degraded Samaritans and treated them subhuman. Eating Cheetos from a bag where a homeless dude's hands had been rummaging probably grosses me out less than their idea of a Jew drinking after a Samaritan. Jesus did not interact with a Samaritan woman as one with honors, rights, and privileges. In fact, the gospel illustrates numerous times where Jesus placed himself at the mercy of those around him. 
we often see Christ's humility as sacrifice, and God knows that it is in many instances a sacrifice for him. The Christ hymn of Philippians 2 celebrates that though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or exploited, but he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did sacrifice. But let's stop for just a second and ask, why did he give it all up? Why was he born in a manger instead of an inn? Why was he poor? Why was he willing to drink after a Samaritan woman? Why did he empty himself of all of the attendant honors, rights, and privileges? As the hymn asks, why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Well, the hymn provides the answer to that question. Because he loves me so. It's for the sake of relationship. True, vulnerable, trusting, sharing, unabridged, loving, healing, life-giving, flourishing relationship. For those of us who've decided to follow Jesus, we're not invited to merely behave like him we are invited to the flourishing that comes with his virtues. When we set aside the things that elevate us and choose the freedom with being human together, we discover that there's no reason to be lonely. A wealthy man who believes that all he has is by his work and chooses only to eat the best because of that station is a lonely man with no one to share a meal with. A person who has shed all of the pretense, and it is just pretense, of the honors, rights, and privileges of our titles and stations can truly be a brother who shares in a handful of Cheetos. Humility is not merely a virtue to be practiced. Like the flagellants who whip themselves into displays of penance, it is instead a recipe for finding and experiencing the truth of our condition, that we are vulnerable, that we need the help and support of our neighbors, and that people are truly in a relationship with us when both give and receive. Look, those diplomas on my wall aren't going anywhere. I'm keeping them. But when do I need to set those attendant honors, rights, and privileges to the side? I'm proud to be Dr. Self. But what would it look like to be Scott with my students? I know that life has offered me privileges. But what new relationships would come about by choosing to focus on what makes us the same as our neighbors? I want to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and visit those in prison. But how might I be able to change, be able to engage in those actions as a real brother? That moment at Kapiolani Park was 20 years ago now, but I still think of that fella every time I call a stranger brother, and I always call strangers brother. Every time, I wonder if there's something I need to shed, some attendant honor or right or privilege, so that I can truly be a brother. And next time someone offers me a Cheeto, I'm going to eat it.